Hola, this is Enrique with another episode of Buen Hombre, Magnificent Mujer. And I have another Buen Hombre with me today, a dear friend and, and quite a, a strong personality and a, really a legend, not only in San Diego, but the entire region. And I had the opportunity to travel with him to Europe this past year, and I'm delighted to be in his beautiful home and in his beautiful uh, studio. None other than Mario Torero. Mario, hey. good to see you again. ¿Cómo estás, Mario? Oh, man. Gusto de verte. Un hombre tremendo. Gracias. <laughs> so here we are. Here we are in your beautiful home. And just like when I used to have my, my uh, radio show and then later I had another podcast, the first question I always ask, uh -huh. who is Mario Torero? When somebody says, Mario Torero, who is Mario Torero? You know, I'm kind of asking that myself because I'm in a transition point right now in a way. See, I, I lived a long life thinking that he was going to go on and on, never end. You know, you remember those days? And then I had this accident that practically put me under, under underground, underwater. I almost drowned oh, yeah. here a year ago, um, uh, August. And so that really changed my life. The recuperation, which took me months, took me into a place I wasn't expecting, in which I was confronted practically with a lifetime of, of stuff. You know, a lot of baggage I had been carrying, so... I knew that bef I knew it was a reason for me to stay in here alive was to do this, finalize the conclusion, the climax, perhaps, of all the work that I've done. And so, first it's been a cleanup, and and now we enter this year, and now is things are really falling into shape, uh, including including uh, how close we're working now, because we've known each other for gee, for the decades, right? The movimiento, 50 years. And, and, but now our, our lives are coming closer because it's kind of like last man standing kind of, you know? I mean, damn, we're, it, most everything has been gentrified, kind of moved on. And, and I don't know where all my partners are, really, you know? Um, if it wasn't for Facebook, I wouldn't even know if they were alive or not. Uh, but, uh, but us, so, we, so, it's, so, so this is the moment where we need to put our heads together, too. We have a long history of experiences, and we have accumulated a, a, a lot of followers in the sense that they know who we are because we, we're active in the community. And, and uh, <clears throat> so, so everybody's asking, so what's going to happen now kind of thing? You know? That's right. Well, so would you say this in a way is the final act? In our lives, or maybe the final act has happened we're into now. We're, it's, it, we're already into the first act. We're into the first act, man. The final act just happened. You know, it's like we're, we're beyond now coming off from apocalypse. People are entering it because we're ahead of this, man. We've been ahead of this a long time. One of the things that uh, I don't believe in coincidences. No. Today is uh, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. Today, Chicago was supposed to play yeah. in San Diego, one of my yeah. favorite bands. And, of course, they have that song, Beginnings. Let's talk about the beginnings of Mario Torero. Ah. When you were young, when you were born, the influence of your father. Tell us a little bit about the beginnings. Huh. Well, you know, the whole thing about being a refugee and immigrant and all that today, you know, that we're so intensely focused on. Actually, I realized that we, I was also a refugee. Some years back, I started to realize that uh, I was an intellectual refugee because things were not so safe at home in Lima. But even before that, my father was a product of the Chile-Peru war in the turn of the century. And so my grandfather and the whole family were had to move because the Chileans took over. And, and he decided not to stay there. He wanted to be with his people, my grandpa said, with con mi gente, los peruanos. So they, he went and they moved to Arequipa, and that's where my father was born. And then from there, uh, because of the economy that crashed, they had to also be refugees for econo economicals, for jobs, for better. so they went to Lima. And while in Lima, the, the political thing was so getting so hard that even I, when I was young, I was, I was almost killed a couple of times by the bully kids. Are, and and, and it's, it's just, let's get out of here. So we came to San, Diego, to San Diego, the United States, in 1960. So El Maestro Acevedo, your father, did he come by choice? Or did he come by necessity? Man. Or was he forced out? He was forced out. He's a, he's a, he's a, we continue to be refugees because not only was I under threat, and he knew that he needed to save me because I'm his first son, and, 
and I'm, a, I'm, I'm an artist like him. He knows that I'm, I'm like him. You know, it's like, like, you know what I mean? Sometimes kids come out and they have their own different things. But I was already an artist and I worked with him all my life together. And so he needed to get up. Plus, one day he showed up at home, man, in the evening. And he kind of laughing and I look at what's going on. And he pulls out a gun, man. He opens up the window and shoots in the air. Bam, bam. And he's smiling about it, you know. And I go, oh, how cool, you know. But I don't know what's going on. Why is he carrying a gun? Why is he showing off like that? We realize that th those were actually blanks. Because he's not a killer. He's not a gangster. And the shit got so fucking bad. And you think he would tell us? No. He had to fucking carry a gun just to, sh to scare off motherfuckers that are coming at him. That's intense. That's very intense. And I remember one of the times I asked you about when you started painting. And of course, with your dad being a... Mm -hmm. the great artist that he was. Do you remember the first time that you were with him and you both painted together? Um, the exact moment, no, but I knew we were because my father was a hustle in every direction about the arts. So every time doing Carnaval, he would be, he would be commissioned to do a Carlos Allegoricos, the, 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 one, the floats. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I remember them so vividly because they had to be very cleverly done and very polished. And so I know I was in the, also the painting with him in, in this pieces, like when I was seven, eight, ten years old. And do you think he was rated <coughs> as the great painter he was while he was alive or was Hell a leader? Yeah, life? no, man. He was a leader in Lima because Lima in the 50s is La Bohemia de Lima, de los, in which all the artists were intensely. A cop trying to copy what had happened in, in, in Europe, in Paris with Picasso. But the moment was that New York was rising. So they all <clears throat> were looking at the United States as artists to get out of there because it was pretty limited. But nevertheless, they were still artists. And so what would they do? They had no, no place to go. But my father had an office downtown, which was actually a front for the hangout of all the artists of the area in the back. And they're, they're painting, they're drawing, and, and, and the cafe, the Chino, the Chino, a través de la calle, we would go across and beer all day because I could not be in my neighborhood. So it was very exciting to see and meet all those artists. Some of them became famous, most of them are disappeared. That reminds me of uh, Mexico City, uh, Diego and Frida and the revolutionaries. Yes. And yes. The, uh, <clears throat> the bohemian spirit. The bohemian spirit, yeah. I but, spent some time in Peru. Ah. And uh, my uh, my cousin went down there to live with her with her husband. Wow, beautiful city, beautiful city, beautiful <clears throat> city, yeah. Lima. I didn't get a chance to visit <clears throat> other areas I wanted to, but I I feel a, a love for that country uh. and the people, like you and other people that I've met. That are oh, from how long were you there? I was only there like five days. But so enough did, to get but, the but, yes, taste yes, and feel, yes. yeah. And then they had that chicha morada, si. that, that wonderful drink and the spirit of the people. and Pisco sours. Yeah, oh, it was fantastic. I really loved it. Yeah. I wish I could have spent more time. So mm -hmm. you come to San Diego. You were in San Diego. About what, how old were you then when you... I was 12 years old when I got here. So you were in high school? Uh, I was actually, I went to the sixth grade in uh, Brooklyn Elementary, which is now the Einstein. Yes, yeah, so I went to kindergarten there. there. Yeah, this. Uh-huh. All white, completely. <laughs> you were privileged, like me. <laughs> Well, I went there because my Not parents white, lived two blocks from there. Yeah. So my mom would walk me to Brooklyn. Yeah. And I would cry and cry. And then the oh. teacher one day said, is there something wrong with Enrique? Oh. And she says, why? Because <laughs> all the children cried when their mom left, but only for about a week. Yeah. Enrique's still crying today, like two months later. So she said, Ooh. bring the gift certificate. So she brought the gift certificate. <clears throat> and she goes, he's not supposed to be mm -hmm. here till next year. Oh, so I was too no little. Wonder. That's why I was crying. Yeah, you knew. But, you felt I, but it. I stayed. Yeah. Maybe that's the reason it turned out the way it did. Really? You're all so problems, advanced. All the problems yeah. that I've had. No, but um, so you were uh, 12 years old, a uh, very yeah. key age in, the, in a yeah. young man's life. Did you speak English at all? No, no English. I loved it all because the only thing I know about the United States, and here I am, is from the movies, right? We see in movies, so everything has been fantasy. And in the, in the late 50s, the, the rock and roll, uh, you know, around the clock and, and switch plays and the gangs. So I came actually scared, thinking I'm going to run into that kind of stuff, you know. Yes. But at Brooklyn, they're all white. They're all white kids. Nice people. Oh, <laughs> hi. Everything was so beautiful. Especially place. when they say, 
uh, uh, where are you from? He said, from Peru. Oh, Peru! They were like saying, oh, thank God it wasn't Mexico, you yes. know, because they're having problems, you know, still trying to forget what the fuck they done, you know? Yes, yes. Well, were you a shark or your jet? You're talking about switch plays yeah. in the neighborhoods. So were you a shark? I, you know, market would be the, the line, but when they put the freeway, I happened to be between the freeway one block or market, so I was, they kicked me out, you go into the black school. So that was a scary situation because I heard some bad things about it from around the rumors. But no, it turned out completely the opposite. Because, because I was playing in the band Trumpet, uh, there was another uh, uh, black brother, Clem, Clem Ware. He played the trumpet. He was so popular. He was already in the top band in San Diego playing with the Kingsmen. Oh, yeah. Very Damn, band. Semper. And so I, I admired him, but, you know, I, I didn't know him. <clears throat> but he picked me up. He adopted me. He said, hey, Joe, come here. Joe, Joe. I said, my name is Mario. No, my name is Bill. Because when I got to school, Brooklyn, they say, on the third day, my father put me in school, sixth grade. And they asked me, what's your name? Guillermo Mario Acevedo. Guillermo, Guillermo. That's William. William, ah, you're Bill. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're Bill. So I became Bill immediately. So I was a gringo on the spot. Man, my family heard about it in Peru because I was still in contact in those first days. You know, I'm a, I'm a gringo already, man. I'm, I'm Bill. Look at that. <clears throat> Until I got to eighth grade in Memorial, when my black brother said, man, you're Joe, man. Bill is a honky's name, man. He said, you, you're Joe. So my name is Joe. Like Jose, but Joe. Mm -hmm. Joe Ace. And, and But you liked, when, when they were calling you Bill, you actually liked that. Oh, in the beginning, I liked it. Because the same thing happened with me. And, and yeah, I, grew well, up, I grew up on the corner of Granada and A Street. So I was on the borderline. It was all American families. Right. Nobody spoke Spanish at home. <laughs> so when I went outside, everybody spoke English. Right. And that's how I learned English. Oh, yeah. The Chicanos never spoke uh, Spanish. That was grandmas and grandpas at home with moms and dads. But we strictly English outside. We wanted to be uh, like, like we, want, we are assimilating it. We love it. We're going to be here Americans and we're going to be better than them. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. you know, try to be better, you know, try to be best. Well, with my family, we were very staunch uh, Mexicans, Mexicans, yeah. Mexicans. And I remember when you said WAPs, you know, that was a term that they would use for the Italians. Yeah. Which meant without papers. Oh, That's man. what W-O-P-S is, without, oh, without papers. papers. They were and, the first illegals? Well, they're not illegals, but undocumented. Undocumented. Yes, so oh. you had the people living it's in a difference. Little, I didn't little, know little, that. Remember the fishermen? Yeah, they yeah. Portuguese, Portuguese. An Italian yeah. fishermen. And that's why my family came here. Yeah. Because my dad was, was Iro Mexico, Iro Via Reforma, and oh. was offered a job in the Mexican government in San Diego because oh. my uncle used to work in the fish and game department oh. because they would go down and check out the fish, the fishing boats, the tuna fishing boats yeah. that would go into Mexican waters. Oh, right. They were predominantly Italian and Portuguese families. Right. I remember you'd have the boats down there on the harbor. They're oh, yeah. We would tight with them because my father was the artist that would paint their boats. If you get to some of those families that had boats, the hanging there is a beautiful, fine art masterpiece by my father. He painted a lot of those. He knew that all the captains of the fishing boats. Sure. Because he landed at Barrio Logan. When he left Peru, to, to, more like an adventure than to save money, he took a fishing boat uh, out of Piura, northern Peru, and he came directly to the canneries. He got off on his way to New York. But he loved it here. He loved the way the Mexican-Americans were receiving it. He stayed at La Bamba, knew everybody, painted the mural at Logan Inn, all within a year. Wow, so that's how you guys ended up here in it San Diego. stayed, yeah. And then you were, uh, so you... Uh, you we landed at Chicano Park. Yeah. <laughs> how, how, uh, how fate would take, you know, your big role in, in Chicano Park. Man. So you remember when the, the, fr the freeway came. First yeah. the five freeway. 65. And, and then the Italians had to move and the Portuguese had to yeah, move. Yeah, they closed and, the canneries. And then and they closed the canneries. Because I remember where I live, you could smell the tuna. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Because the, the, the canneries. And here, practically. Oh, yeah. That, that was a whole different uh, life. And the smell, the, the gaviotas. I would be fishing there, right, while it's going, because my father's going in there to the boats, and he's getting free tunas, man. And while I'm there fishing, the smelts, large ones, and Japanese were teaching me how to fish there. Now, By Kakita Beach. It's called Kakita Beach, that area. That's right. Because the little beach is there. So you were, uh, you, you were a musician and an artist. When did the artist take over? Oh, well, I always had that. In school, it was always like people ask kids are asking me to do drawings for this and that. Sometimes you get me into a little trouble here, but uh, but it, it continued. But I didn't take it seriously until the middle, until the almost after the middle '60s when I moved to San Francisco. Uh, I was a hippie, 
and and so all those psychedelic posters that you see in those days I, I thought I could do that and I could save me money from buying it and I didn't blarge so I started doing psychedelic posters on large pieces of paper which then evolved into canvases but um, but I still wasn't serious until until the end of 1969 early 1970 when I went to the concert of the Grateful Dead downtown in Civic Center and I took some mescaline because I was I was dealing that shit and and he, I had an overdose with that crap, and I I I I was flat out like in a coma a couple of days. I survived. I woke up, and I thought I was dead. Here I am, and so I said, "What am I going to do here?" You know. So I felt like God was speaking to me already. A voice said that you're going to join the revolution, and I said, "What revolution?" He says, "Trust me." Okay. A few days later, I get a phone call, and my partner. Uh, he says, there's going to be a meeting of Chicano artists in front of the Ford building. I said, wow. So I went there a few days later, a couple of days later, at nighttime, in front of it. And sure enough, in the dark, I saw some guys there standing, about a handful, seven, eight people. But one of them was taller than the rest, was in the middle, and he said, he was moving around, he saw me. And so I never seen Salvador Torres. Yes. Yeah, I he, can imagine when you said that, I figured yeah, it, was it was him. Did he have a feather in his hat when he was doing that? Not yet. Yeah, or no, not that night. We were all had our berets on, right. man, because uh -huh. of brown berets and black berets. I had been playing with the Black Panthers for a while, you know? So, so it was kind of an amazing gathering there. The forces coming together to create this beautiful Chicano culture that we're living in. So you had Queso, you had some other artists. So, yes. There. And then when did the whole Chicano Park... Because this is, you know, you're a little older than me. So yeah. all this Chicano oh. Park table yeah. and stuff, yeah. I remember it as a spectator. Yeah. I was not a participant. I was yeah. still too young. Mm -hmm. but, so when it, how did that come about? Well, when we got together for this meeting was because Salvador had been in the Bay Area and saw what the, the Chicanos were doing up there in Sacramento and San Francisco. So he came here and he thought we were a little behind. So it was the perfect timing for him to try to get this going. And and so he got he got access into the Ford building because he was doing some large banners. He got the okay for him to do his art. But while he was in there, he recognized that the place was being underused, closed. And so he says, this could be a perfect place to do a Centro Cultural de la Raza. So so that was the meeting was about. Him and Guillermo Aranda had been talking because they knew each other. So it was my first time that I met all of them. Sal Tomás Castañeda, El Coyote, José Ramos from Tijuana, among others, no? And the idea was, we did the tour, and we, says, we said, we're going to take it over, we take it over. Right there, we all shook hands, and from that point on, <clears throat> we organized ourselves, brought the community in. We became the Totecas in Aslan, with other families, and the Enriquez family particularly. Mm -hmm. And we had a beautiful group, the whole community got behind it. And we were there until April, when we heard that there was going to be a big rally against the police station in the barrio, because um, a friend of ours, Mario Solis, the Black Panther, uh, I mean the Brown Beret, had found out that the, the city secretly was going to put a police station right there where Chicano Park is today. So we were there picketing, and we, you know, that was from January when we moved in into the Ford building, Centro Cultural, and then by April we were in the, back in the barrio, <clears throat> uh, liberating more land, you know, because we took over also in May, the the neighborhood house. What exactly was there at Chicano Park at that time? Was there grass and kind of a park, or was it just dirt? What was there? Dirt. They had just finished this bridge, so it was dirt under, not not even concrete, nothing, dirt. And they probably were going to put concrete like they do over there and uh, you know other other places. They had the pillars and, and just a bunch of dirt. Dirt, and nothing. Then, and then somebody or a few of you did a call out. Yeah. And you went over there and took over the park, basically. Well, we were there, a large group, the whole community, and me and the Toltecas. And uh, we were doing that sick pick, the picket signs and the banners, and we were there just... Ah, ah, ah. And, and then on that April 22nd, that's when it happened, when Mario Solis, against the guy that had found out and made the call, and that was the first walkouts that we had because... Because the word went out, and all the region, the Chicanos in the, in the schools came out and to march to be there. And, and Mario was able to hotwire one of the bulldozers that had been there mm -hmm. uh, sitting. And when that happened, to cover the, the, the machine, it was like, we're taking over everything. So we, we put the 
signs down. And, and at that time, what was the temperament of San Diego towards? They have always seen us. You know, uh, we are not Americans because only whites can be Americans, right? Troublemakers. Oh yeah, the, the worst. I mean, we lived under this state. Every time we go out into the streets, you know you're going to get stopped by the police, harassed. If you're in a car, one or two more stop you and search your car and always messing with us. It was a constant thing. I think people forget that when you when the group did that at Chicano Park, what the temperament of the city was at that time. So how did they respond? How did they respond when you were all taking over the park? How oh, did the, how the police respond? Well, you know, it had been building up through the 60s, the civil rights movement, when the blacks were doing and the Black Panthers. And I, said, my, I was hanging out with blacks. I, I was raised with blacks. So I was naturally a, a groupie of the Black Panthers there, going to the meetings and, 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 and passing the newspapers and involved with it. And that was reflecting my artwork already. I did have a lot of sketches at that time of, that, of, the, of the revolution happening. And, but when the, one of them got shot, um, and so and so that really scared me and many of us. I uh, lived in San Francisco for a while with my cousin, and then I returned, and I was the artist for La Verdad. Marbury's had a, a magazine, a newspaper, weekly, uh, La Verdad, and I was there, you know, from the, those first issues. Do you still have copies of that? Yeah, I do, man. I'm, right I'm, now we're working on a project, and we're going to be going to Spain in the near future. Project there of some artists, and they have, they redid Cesar Chavez's magazine, El Marquillado. El Marquillado, yeah. Now we're on this timeline, this incredible mm. life, Chicano Park. Chicano Park, um, they save it from being a police station. Mm -hmm. so, so what happens? You're, you're down there, the mm -hmm. police aren't happy. How about the news coverage and the community? What at was that going time. on? What was yeah. going on at that time when you were doing that? You and the others were doing that. I, but myself, I was so personally involved in to being in the forefront that all I was seeing was just a revolution in, in full bloom. The organizing was going on with the Brown Berets and the and Chicano artists working together. And now we didn't have to be just in Baboa Park because we had been there for four months in Centro Cultural. And that continued and we still try to get that got that going. But but most but half of us we switched. We stayed in Barrio Logan and we formed a new organization. We call ourselves then the Congreso de Artistas Chicanos en Aslan in nineteen seventy. And that, that, that was the CACA, well known in that time for CACA. And, and that's, no shit, no shit. No shit. Was and caca? We were called CACA. No shit? No shit. And we got, we were getting, thank we, you very much, folks. We got our shit together. That's why. We, we, we were meant to get our shit together, so we did it. But, it, for a bit, but I, that was my contribution as a Peruvian, as a, as a Quechuan descent, that in Quechua, Titicaca is, is, is a birthplace, and that's a holy and sacred place. Titi is jaguar and caca is stone because we're stone worshippers and because we came from stones and we will return to stones, and something like that. But uh, we were really, that's, that's, that was the first time that there was the Arts District was happening really, right now that was happening in Barrio Logan. Well, it was happening in those days. We opened up galleries and we had shops, if you remember. The Chicano Federation was just down the street. Porkinan was still there. It was Barrio pretty Station. active, yeah. No, Barrio no, no, Station, no, no. Barrio Station. Padre Hidalgo Center. Uy, jole. Padre Hidalgo Center. My sister used to work there. At that corner? Yeah. It was a Padre Hidalgo. Padre Hidalgo. Right before then. Oh, yeah, because uh, Rachel came much later there. That's right, you know? yeah. So that's what I was thinking of. The Padre Hidalgo Center. Padre Hidalgo. Where my oldest sister, Laura, who was born in Tijuana. She uh -huh. used to work there. Uh -huh. My oldest brother, Luis, was born in Culiacán. Yeah. My sister in Tijuana. And then I and my little sister, Nora Patricia, so it's her feast day today, and my little brother, Pete. We're born in San Diego. Mm -hmm. So uh, how about, you mentioned the Brown Berets. How was the relationship with the Black Panthers? Well, the Black Panthers had disappeared already by then. You know, Everybody was developing on themselves because Black and Brown was really, never really got together. It was always separate. That's the way the system wanted it, and that's the way it was kept. Right, divide and conquer. No? Uh, but although we saw what each other were doing, we already had the consciousness, I believe, but we didn't we were not working together. The Black Panthers moved on their own. And I was the only white, uh, light guy there uh, uh, throughout the time, you know, with the bands and in the bar and the, the ghetto, and in the in the Black Panthers. But but then when I went underground and they came up again with the brown berets, it was all brown, for the most part. 
And here and there, some, there, was, there was communications between the leadership because after we did the Chicano Federation, immediately friends of ours, the leadership of the blacks, we were always in contact. They created the, Chica the Black Federation, if you remember, Sukumu yeah. and you know, so, so many. Right, and then, because um, that neighborhood, there was a lot of blacks there before. Definitely, man. And then Logan Heights was the, black and brown. And no? I know that more recently, you and I have discussed the idea of yeah. honoring that community. Yeah. It's important to remember, oh, it's to a remember. passion, man. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so the so the Chicano movement is alive and well. Um, yeah. You're getting, you have the Centro Cultural de la Raza, uh, Chicano Park. Yeah. And how was the Chicano community overall? All communities, I don't care which one it is, there's always division. There's jealousies and this kind of thing. Was everybody pretty much united on this front that we had to uh, not let the police oppress the community yeah. that is a park? For the children, etc. Yeah. Did you see that unity then? Amazing! It was a, it was a hundred percent revolution, and the, the the community which had been quiet most of the time, uh, the elders, the the parents, it was the kids fighting in the streets with the police and the oppression and the school and so on. But uh, when after the revolution, uh, you know, the the parents might still be nervous a bit, but because we never got uh, arrested or the police kind of let up. We showed our strength, and it was respected somehow from the very beginning. As far as I remember it, it's always been a struggle because there's always been uh, a, a, a oppression coming from there because they still don't have Chicanos on TV, and you know, I mean, so that racism is still was there. But we felt strong for the first time, especially what was happening in the universities. For the first time, we have Chicano studies. You know, we, that's celebrating also 50th anniversary. Sure. So we ha all our friends were already teaching at um, City College, all throughout the colleges. So it became a full-blown cultural revolution. Or a history, we, that's what we found out, who Frida Kahlo was, because we had never known about. So the, in the beginning, the Chicano the, uh, movement was to, to decolonize and, and start reading and learning about it. And it was intense. We were always talking about it every weekend. There was something on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Now, I, I'm fairly familiar with Chicano Park. I've been there many, many times. One of my first events, there was actually a race. The very first time they had a race, a foot race. It was a 5K, and uh -huh. I used to be a, a distance runner back then. But, um, but Chicano Park is mainly known for the murals. Which were the first murals, and how did that come about? I can't believe it, because every time I give a tour, I speak about it that although we took over the park in 1970 uh, and we are ready to kill on the walls and we know what we're gonna do and so on that is but it still took three years the first mural at chicano park was painted in in 1973 and, and to be exact is the only one we have really truly an exact date march 27 1973 because i was moved by what was happening on that first day that i painted the 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 the, the date up on up on the wall and it's still there no you don't find that kind of a phenomenon in any of the other ones no information or anything no signature nothing but that one i tagged it march you know 27th. march 27 1973 which mural is it and where is it in chicano park well it's um uh, it's, it's the beginning of the bridge so the landing of uh, coronado going into the mainland and going south when you're going to enter five south that curve there of the ramp is where where uh, the on the side right as he lands on the at the street level and he enters the freeway there's a retaining wall there on logan avenue that that uh, that is that it was easy to paint because it was only like 18 feet high so with a ladder we were able to complete something large was and it's the beginning actually the chicano park either begins or ends at that point so that's where it began. Uh, now we know it was the, the arrow point, practically. So we painted there this wall. Mm. And it was a handful, about seven or eight of us. We planned it, we got there, and it was practically completed on that first day. Of course, the, it, that was the shot that was heard around us land there. You know, finally the paints come. And so immediately a lot of artists came and we crossed the street, that's, that's the second the next street. Uh, the historical mural, Chicano mural, historical wall, that was painted on the second day. And of course, the work continued from that point forward. But that was 1973. 
So then, so then, uh, but we painted in March, so close to Chicano Park Day. So it's only when I wrote close to Chicano Park Day, we paint. Usually one or two pillars. So then comes 1974. Well, after we finished this first one, I, I looked at, we started with one, and I look at Chicano Park, all the pillars, no colors, nothing, dirt, still. And, and I'm wondering, that's too many pillars. We won't, we won't be able to do this. So I tell Kesso, man, I talked to the group, and I said, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to get to all that? So Salvador says, well, you start at one point, and you start making circles. But every time you make one circle, you get bigger and bigger and bigger, and pretty soon, things will come together that way. Mm. Oh, yeah. Like I always knew what he was talking about. So immediately I organized our first excursion of statewide caravan of going from city to city to, to introduce ourselves from, from, from Chicano Park to paint with them and invite them to come and paint with us. So you would paint with them in their cities? In their cities. And then come, come down to San Diego to yeah. Chicano Park and paint with us. So in February 1974, uh, I took a, a, skir- uh, a group of us here and we went there and met the leader of the project that was happening there was called Strata Courts. And this is like the Chicano Park of LA, you know, because it's a, it's a housing project with large walls. They all have a, an end wall about 20 feet by 40 feet, and those were being painted around that time. And they were not held back like we were. So they, we already, they already had walls that, from 1974, they had been painting. We had to wait till 73, so we had so we really had to push fast to catch up. So going there, I was able to score on a wall, and we planned it, painted it in 1974 there in February 1974. It was called Aslan, and um, and then and then by April, that same group, El Clavo Felix, he, uh, Ricardo Felix, Richard Felix, he he brought his group, which by then it was called LA Caca. So San Diego Caca, we went there, talked to them, and they agreed we were going to have a Lake Caca. And so they came and painted in 1974 uh, from L.A. area, one from Long Beach. They painted theirs. And while we were there, we saw another one that was empty. And, by, uh, and um, so we decided to dedicate that one to Allende, which just has happened the year before, you know, when they took down Allende on 911 uh, 73. So we made a dedication there to the Chile Revolution. In your famous uh, painting, No One is a Minority, when was that painted? You are not a minority. That was actually a poster that I made. When I married my second wife, Rita Sanchez, she was already in her own, uh, a a feminist, uh, an activist already, teaching at Mesa College at, at, no, San Diego State. And uh, so we came together and it was forces coming together because she knew all the academics and, and the art departments of the universities. I was, I was new to me. So I was encouraged to go to school. Well, I did go to school in the 70s, but I met her in 1977. And one of the first things that we did putting our heads together was do something that has some kind of uh, uh, impact. And we came up with that, celebrating the 10th anniversary of the martyrdom of uh, Che Guevara. He was he was killed in, in August 8, 1977. 67. So by 1977, we came up with this poster, uh, of dedicated to, to uh, to you. We are not a minority. It was that one was we called. That, uh, the poster said, "You are not a minority," but then a year later, I. We, I wanted to blow it up, and that's when I went back to Strata Courts and painted my second mural in 1978. Uh, the, the, uh, we are not a minority, so it changed from you to we. And that's one of the more famous murals up there. Yeah. And you see it a lot on television shows, movies. You see that mural. Yeah. And how things go around in circles. Not too long ago, we were with our dear friend, Josefina Lopez. Yeah. And she wants you to paint a mural. But with a woman's perspective, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, Super and we, we've talked about several ideas yeah, on that, yeah. and how, uh, how we keep the movement going forward. Yes. How we keep the movement going forward yes. through art. And bring it our history. Yes. So even no matter how many of the kids may say, you know, they're, they're, they're Latinx and, you know, Chicano movement is over, it's our time. 
you know, they, they are, we created that foundation when there wasn't before, didn't exist before. So everything comes from the Chicano roots. Anything that is Latino and even all the Hispanics are just being sucked by it, you know? Right, right. It's all one big brown movement now. And we were, uh, just a few months ago, we were together in Berlin. Right. We went there for the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall with our friend Adrian Luz over there. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one of the things that we did was you gave a talk on Chicano, Chicano Park, what it is to be a Chicano. So when somebody says to you, what is a Chicano? How, how do you explain that? What yeah. is your definition? Well, kind of uh, sim simplified. Does, does it depend on who's asking you? Uh, perhaps. You know, I mean, the police. An academic German uh, academic from yeah. the university asking you. Yeah. Versus uh, uh, a Latino student from San Diego High. Would you give the same answer? Uh, probably not. You know, I would I would cuss more with the with the with the with the kids, believe me, than the other one. Nevertheless, uh, I, 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 I'm 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 an example of that. I was born in Peru, but I came here. I was raised here in the United States. So to me, I see it uh, uh, technically as any Latin Latin American that moves to the United States and then assimilate try, in the assimilation becomes something else. Chica and then, but then there's been Mexican Amer Mexicans were here before the before they became uh, yeah, United States. Right. So so it's not like they have to move here. It's the evolution from that Mexicans were were taken over and 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 pushed to assimilate with that false thing and, and all the repression and the torture that we went through, forged a whole a new type of a human a human. He's not, re he's not really American, the white American that they're, they're feeding us. And we're not the Mexican that, that was, and Peruvian that was there on the other side. We're here now with the two powers, and we become one with it. We have fused it. We are hybrid. We're the new post-American cultural, American culture, Chicano culture. We are, we are, we're American. We're, we're, the Americans, we... They might be the foundation even, but it's a whole new world that we're looking at because for the first time, indigenous people are participating as fully as Americans. And, and it's, uh, the latest thing is that we're not trying us, we were, they were trying to tell us to assimilate, we have reversed it. They have to assimilate to us. That's the way it is. We're reversing the assimilation. We stopped it with the Chicano movement in 1970, and we began creating a whole new wave, a new movement, which is no longer like the swastika moving, let's say, towards destruction, but is the swastika moving towards creation. And that brings up something very interesting. Here you are, revolutionary, pioneer. Visionary. Visionary, activist, artivist. Shamanistic. How do you all of a sudden get involved with the Arts Commission? That's sort of like a uh, white collar yeah. of another world. So where do those How two worlds uh, combine? Mira, the revolution starts with the ground roots, with the students, with the youth. And they change society. Look what's happened to the Bolshevist Revolution. All those people, all those young men that created Russia, or Chinese. You think Mao Zedong was always old? He was a young man when the revolution started, right? Uh, all of us, you know, we did not do a revolution overnight. He had been building up, and you had to be with the people. So, so what's the question? So the Arts Commission. Yeah, the Arts Commission. That's so weird, huh? So what happened is we created the Chicano movement, and I say, I told my father, I said, you know, we are here in the body, we're taking it over. But I want San Diego, man. I mean, I know that art is universal. So let's go to San Diego. So my father had connections and some money. So we rented the space downtown, which I was wanted to do the cultural arts center of downtown. And it became that. The, in 1977, we opened up the Acevedo International Gallery. And I, I did a proposal, me and Coyote and Kaka, we did a proposal called uh, Project Rainbow because of Jesse Jackson. And we took it to the city to present it as an arts, as an arts project for, for, for San Diego. Chicanos were leading it, but it wasn't for Chicanos. It was for all artists of San Diego. Because by then, we, when we opened up the gallery, we had white artists, black artists. You know, to us, it didn't matter. You're young, you're, you're for revolutionary, let's do it together. 
So we presented to them, and uh, they say, as usually, we expected it. White people there sitting down. The Parks and Rec used to handle it. There was no arts group yet. They didn't even want arts around. So, so then, you know, they got rid of it in 1973 with Proposition 13, and they're trying to mix us up with this new one here. I don't understand it. But uh, so this is 1977. We present this to the city because of the bicentennial. We opened up a gallery in 1976 thinking like, man, what a way to celebrate the American bicentennial. Chicanos downtown in our gallery, right? This is the proof. But by 1977, you know, they, and so they say no. But in, in the commission, and in this uh, um, Parks and Rec board that we presented to, we walk off from them, give them the finger, and we walked off. And then a lady in there came out running after us. Uh, June Goodflesh was her name. Una gringa, no? Hey, you guys, what do you want? You know, what is it? You know, you already said no to it, you know, bullshitting. And she says, no, no, I think I can help you. Yeah, how? Well, I lived in San Francisco, so, but I worked for many years with my friend Rene Yanez. Mm -hmm. Rene Yanez, you guys are partners? Yeah, yeah. But, but, my gosh, hey, come on, let's go. Man, we went, had a drink, and turned over the proposal to her. She says, 180000 is too much, though, but let me work it out. I don't care. You want, let's work it out. Let's do it. So she took it with her, and, and, and with her and the other, her other friends. Um, and they were gay, uh, which was beautiful with us. We didn't care. Art is art, right? And, and she was able to pass it through and got the, got the money from CETA program. Uh, what's his name, Mr. The President? The beautiful president in 1980. Uh, he was, he was uh, 1976, I think, he got elected, 77, Carter. Mm -hmm. He had a program called the CETA program. So we were able to get, and, and the proposal came out to 180000 So we were yeah, right yeah. on the, man. For 180000 we got the Ninth Opistias building, the four-story building where the Horn Plaza is, because it was a historical building. We were in there uh, for four years, from 1977, to 1982, three, four, five years, and then they destroyed it, you know. But while he was there, it was the first time that artists from all colors came together. Mm. White people never even sat next to brown people like this or black artists because we were artists. Beautiful thing. It was the beginning. I mean, the, the, the Lyceum Theater was there. All those, all those key people that are right now in about our age in, in the arts, we started at the Community Arts Center, mm. you know. You know, I'm the founder of House of Mexico. There is right. still no House of Mexico. Yeah. Our friend Gladys Jones, still no House of Peru. Mm -hmm. We're still working on it. There's still mm -hmm. a lot of issues mm -hmm. that we have yeah. to deal with. Yeah. But we're moving It's forward. advancing. But it's advancing. Yeah, but it took a long time. We're, moving, we're, we're moving, moving forward. Uh, thanks to pioneers like Mario Torero, visionaries. So today, okay, we talked a lot about your growing up, how you came here, the movements that you've been involved with, your vision, your action. Because there's a difference between vision and vision and action. You do both. You don't just talk about it. You get it done. Uh, so where are we today? Where, where are you today with all your projects? I know we're working together on several things that like we started the conversation. But when somebody says, oh, Mario Torero, we're talking about Mario Torero today. Mm -hmm. So who do you say you are today? Well, I, I kind of gave up. I, I have a lot of dreams, right? And they, they go by and they don't happen. So you kind of get old and you get into new dreams or new realities. But a lot of the dreams that I had are becoming true. One of them was that, you know, every artist wanted to be discovered, that discovery point. So you know, so you're, you're, you're great and you know you're going to be discovered any moment. And I take my arts to the, to the museum, the La Jolla, show it to them. Oh, nice, but, you know, no, not today. So they kind of added to the racist attitude because we were doing political art, you know. They didn't like political art. And so they're trying to still manipulate us up. We, so we had to do our own thing. And that's how I developed into the question. Where is Mario today? Oh. Where is Mario today? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so I did my own thing. And, and I created my own image, I, my own personal type of art, you know, uh, in the Chicano art realm. So then the discovery did happen about four years ago. Don't exactly remember how it happened, but somebody, somebody, oh yeah, it's the, the, the poet laureate of the United States, uh, our friend from uh, San Francisco. Yeah, that was here a few years ago, yeah. Uh, yeah. Felipe, Felipe, Felipe. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, Ilkam Herrera, I think it's Felipe Herrera. He, good friend, because 
we got high here many times, you know, we go back, you know, in San Diego. He, he was visiting the Library of Congress and they want to show him uh, uh, Latino art. And he's looking through, you know, yeah. But I don't see anything here from Chicano Park, from San Diego. Oh, and no, no, it's always L.A. or San Francisco, always L.A. And so he said, oh, well, uh, do you suggest anybody? He said, yeah. So he, he told her, eh, Mario Torero, Victor Ochoa, I don't know who else he said. So, so then she, they contacted me. And uh, they say, hey, you know, we, we, they told me the story about, oh, yeah, you know, I don't, and so they asked me to submit some works, and I submitted them, and immediately it was like a hit. I, I sent uh, uh, 20 of them. And, you know, just so you could pick one or two from them, they took them all. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. And that was the beginning. Huh. And, and that's that. It's that. It's to the top. Hey. So, so the following year, I went, I, I, I was showing at the museum in New Jersey. My, my daughter, who lives in back east, she says, Daddy, can uh, I love to see you? I mean, what, what can we do? I said, man, what if we went to Washington, D.C.? And, and she, oh, yeah, we'll take you there, so on. And then, what else? And so I, I thought I was joking with her. Make an appointment with the Library of Congress. And, and she got it. And I said, uh, how about the Smithsonian? And she got an appointment with the Smithsonian. What about the Embassy of Peru? She called them, got three appointments. Oh my, on the following year, on the next trip, I'm on my first trip to Washington, D.C. Went there and, and met with the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian, they were re renovating it, so we postponed it. And I went back again next year, met with the Smithsonian. And then went to the uh, Embassy of Peru and they, they loved my work and the fact that I was already uh, discovered by the Library of Congress, you know, that's good points. So they gave me a show. Went back again this year and had an opening there, met with the Smithsonian. They loved my work. They, 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 they incorporated me into a show that is called, it's opening up on 9-11, Washington DC, unless they postponed it. At the Smithsonian, it's called uh, the Revolution, Chicano Revolution through the graphic arts. And what's going to be the icon of the revolution at that show? You are not a minority poster. Wow, that's fantastic. That's a great way to kind of go full circle. Mm -hmm. One last question. Um, Eyes of Picasso. Mm. That's one of your best known mm. pieces. Mm -hmm. For you, when people say, which piece do you identify with the most? Which one would you say? Oh, my pieces? Yeah, like when somebody says, which one represents you the best? Yeah. I know you have a lot. It's like your children, you know. Like you yeah, 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 yeah. It, it depends on the arena. I, it, it, easel painting is, is a Picasso, the one I have. And then, and then uh, maybe historical, maybe uh, the, the Colossus in Chicano Park because of the power that it's bringing to Chicano Park. And, and the other one is the Asa Picasso. The Asa Picasso became the, the, freak, the freak flag of, of, of the local artists here in San Diego when I painted it at the Community Art Center, first in 1978. But how that got there? How did I decide to be the Asa Picasso? No? Well, when we painted in 1973, uh, I, uh, you know the San Diego papers never spoke about it, never gave us any action. The only action that ever gave it to the us was my father. My father was always in the newspaper because of his beautiful art. That's what gave strength to a lot of Chicano artists in the 60s because we had never, a Latino being, being, being hooray, hurrah in the newspaper and, and locally. It was always negative or non-existing for the most part, invisible, invisible people. But my father gave strength to it because, oh, you're Peruvian, maybe that. But to, to Raza, we're all brown people. We know that. So, so that kind of uh, enthusiasm and, and, and uh, inspiration is what, what continued. Question? But, but the eyes of Picasso. Oh, okay. The fact that sometimes a prophet is not recognized in his own town. Absolutely. You have to go outside and all of a sudden, wow. Yeah, yeah. Kind of it, seems that way. it seems that way. It seems that way. Although, other although times. well, pop, you got, I got the popular vote. Because I used to be practically on the paper every day in San Diego too, always doing something. My art was always outstanding. Like, uh, like there's many, many uh, schools of art, and even Chicano art. Chicano art is a school of art in itself, 
but my I describe my, my work as impactist. Like you got the impressionist, expressionist, and the impactionist people, <laughs> the artists. All right, mine has to have impact in order for me to produce it, and he has that. That's why I was in the in the, in the paper, like I said, a lot of time. But but when we painted Chicano Car Park uh, uh, on that and, and on, on that date uh, uh, in March '73. Nothing on the paper, nothing in the, in no, no announcements, locally, except local locally. But France sent a writer to meet with us specifically to speak about who we were and what is this Chicano art movement. And she came in um, around June, July, she spent a whole month and did an article that came out afterwards, August of September, and Queso can follow up on that. But uh, but when she came to do the documentation, she also brought with her a gift to the Chicano artist. It came from Picasso because we painted in, 19, uh, in 1973, on March we paint, and Picasso dies in 1973 in April 8th. A little over 10 days after we paint the first Chicano painting, mural, which changes the whole way People see art, public art. There was never any public art like that. Those colors. So she brought with her the gift that came through the Bitoclas Foundation. The Alice Bitoclas Foundation was founded through uh, Gertrude, Jen, uh, Gertrude Stein, who was the discoverer of Picasso back in, in Paris. So to them, they sent this four by six replica, a black and white, on canvas of the eyes of Picasso. Shot by the famous Picasso uh, photographer Douglas, Duncan Douglas. So this was precious in itself. I remember being in Kessel's studio, and I was in, in, in one of his rooms looking at some of the stuff he was working. And he's in the other room with her. I don't know what they're doing. And I don't bother, you know. I just hear noise, this and that. And, and next thing he says, hey, Mario, come over here. Let me show you this. Let me show you something. So I go over there, and there he is. And he explains to me how the gift came and how she brought it. So this unveiling here, and we were admiring it and wondering how the connections happened with Picasso, because we remember so well when Picasso died. When Picasso died, it was, was a heavy day for us, full moon. Grunians on the beach, me and Queso on the beach screaming, and Queso screaming, Que viva Picasso! Que viva Picasso! Mm -hmm. So I said, oh, Picasso. Ah, Picasso, Picasso, Queso. So I was trying to discover there the many mysterious things that could happen because, you know, we thought it was cheese, but no, Queso, Picasso. Salvador Torres, like myself and many of us, we reflect upon Picasso, upon the kind of, he was the kind of artist, he was a true artist that we were, we could identify with. Mm -hmm. A revolutionary artist. In the medium, in society, in the way he perceives the world. A lover, a lover of world, of life, of nature, no? So, so here we are, we have this, The eyes of Picasso. And Queso says, Mario, why don't you take this? I think I know, I think, I think you'll know what to do with this. Yeah, sure, yeah. You know, I'm always a, oh, you know, something will happen. I took it with me in 1973. So we're, and, and I just put it away. And here we are with the Community Art Center. It's 1978. And I realized that if I'm a muralist, and I'm painting murals all throughout town, and I got to paint one on this building. And he had a beautiful, large wall on the side facing south, and it was the perfect size because the Asa Picasso could fit in there. And, and I almost knew immediately that's where I would put it. And the original was black and white, and so this one here, I did it all in full color, the Asa Picasso. And partly because when we decolonizing, Chicanos hated Spanish people. We hated the Spanish for what the fuck they done to us. 
with their church and with their guns and with their dope and shit. And so, but I still felt that not, not every Spanish is bad, just like not every Jew is bad or any black is bad or any Mexican, Chicano is bad. There's good and bad in everything, right? So here we are. We're gonna I'm going to present was the most beautiful artist in the world, loved by all the white people. So we're going to, I'm going to sneak in the Chicanismo into the, into, the, into the mainstream by putting Picasso there, and, they, and they're going to accept it because they weren't going to accept that we're going to put that political Chicano art, that revolutionary, that shit downtown because I need, still needed to get it okay, I thought. So I thought, they, go, they love Picasso? Well, they put Picasso up. And that's what it was. Uh, uh, um, a memorial to our legacy. Because we are so Spanish, too. You know? That's an incredible story. Last question. That was the last one. No, it was the last one until I remembered that I'm supposed to have a last question. And I'm going to be asking that to all of, of all my guests. To Mario Torero. What is Love. Love. What is love? Love, love is a, a woman because she represents Mother Earth, which is Pachamama, our goddess, which is the time that we live in. It's not a macho time. It's, this, is, this is an emblem, which is, which is a female, which is la mujer, my mother, you know, my sister, my lover, my, 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 my child. It's everything to me. Even today, I said, I know, I know I was a woman in my other life. Kind of thing, why not, right? In my next life, after me, I'm going to be a woman again. And then I'll be a man again, and so on, no? Our seats continue. Love is life. My brother, muchas gracias, hermano. I love you. And don't, don't forget in November, we got to get out the vote. Amen. Yes, que viva. Gracias.